Welcome, everyone, to another exciting week with our Mission Matters Twitter Spaces. Once a week, we put together these dialogues where we interview top executives, athletes, entertainers, super producers, and more. Our mission at Mission Matters is to amplify the stories of entrepreneurs, executives, experts. We want to inspire and educate future generations. And so the way that we go about doing this is we are a media brand, but beyond just a media brand, we're also a book publishing company. We are a podcast agency. We are a PR agency and also a digital marketing agency. We've been going at this for the last seven or so years. We've got an amazing team here. Many of our podcasters and authors are actually joining us right now and in this dialogue. And, you know, I know they have some great questions for Fernando as well. And so with that, I'm going to introduce our guest of honor, Fernando. So for many of you, Fernando Garibay is a record producer, songwriter, artist, DJ, entrepreneur, academic, and polymath. He was the official music director of Lady Gaga's Born This Way Ball and executive producer of her Born This Way album. Garibay has written, produced, and creatively directed for several artists, including Lady Gaga, U2, Whitney Houston, Britney Spears, Enrique Iglesias, Bruno Mars, Rihanna, Sia, Kylie Minogue, Shakira, Paris Hilton, and many more. Fernando, formerly an executive producer and artist at Interscope Records, spent over a decade as part of the in-house creative team at Interscope under the mentorship and direction of Jimmy Iovine, ultimately rising to be the chief producer. Fernando is also the founder and CEO of Garibay Institute and Center, which aims to instill creativity frameworks and orthogonal thinking to achieve higher levels of performance with global leaders in corporate, academic finance, and entertainment and policy. Fernando is a mentor at several startup accelerators, such as Generator, Title Town Tech. Fernando is also a guest lecturer at Harvard University, Harvard Business School, and at MIT in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Fernando has also participated with the World Economic Forum, Young Global Leaders, Shapers as a keynote speaker, a salon contributor, and a co-producer of Digital Davos 2023. Amazingly, I've had the opportunity to actually experience the Garibay Institute, so I got a sneak peek amazing. I've never experienced anything like it. And I also got to meet Fernando at the World Economic Forum event that I just mentioned. So, you know, eclectic speaker. But with that, Adam, let me pass the baton here. And why don't we get the show on the road? Thank you, Fernando. Wow. Thank you for the kind intro. It's an honor to be here. I've heard so much about your, your mission matters and an incredible work you're doing to facilitate distribution and output for great thinkers, such as the, the rest of the crew that's on here. So really flattered and, and honored to be a part of this, this conversation. Awesome, Fernando. And we're, we're great to have you here. And I guess just to kick this off, as I see your background and I've seen your work, DJ, producer, songwriter, entrepreneur, a lot of titles that you hold and you've done many <laughs> things at a, at a very high level. And so as I was kind of researching your background, I, I'm kind of interested to know, when did you kind of make the connection between your creativity and being an entrepreneur? Like, was there one versus the other that started first? Were they at the same time? Like, like how did that, how did that link up? Well, it, it's most, most of us, you know, there, there wasn't, there wasn't a vernacular that was instilled as, as a, you know, there was such a career as an entrepreneur because it's a bit of abstract, right? Because what that says is that you can do whatever you like as long as you do it as a business and a founder, you you have a, a title there. <laughs> but for me, it came through more in, in an organic sense. I actually don't really use the word entrepreneur at all. And for the very reason that most of us who have not had the privilege to access of this information, such as, you know, let's say grew up in communities that, you know, in, in a behavior deterministic sense, it wasn't the Stanford culture that was given or, or, or postulated at every corner, right? It was a different type of culture. So you stumble your way through this. And for those who know my background, I came from, you know, Southeast and South Central and East LA, you know, communities, which I still call a big part of my identity and, and who I am today. So to answer your question, my origin came in an organic sense, as did the rest of my careers. So in the way I made became a musician in starting a very young age, you know, four, four to the age of seven, I'm picking up, you know, drums and then teaching myself other instruments. And along with the help of mentors and family, I, you know, acquired the ability to find other mentors and led a, a passage of learning every instrument, learning every aspect of what I considered vocabulary, which was music, in which I communicated to the world what I thought was a very normal language, but it's not in a traditional sense. It's an acquired skill and an acquired language. And that, so that's why I learned that 
as what a musician is. I didn't know there was such a thing as a producer, right? As a career in making music. Equally, I didn't know there's a career as an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. right? So it's a long formed answer to your question. It, it all came organic. It came in a sense of, well, if I keep losing money and following <laughs> my dreams, it's not sustainable. So I need to figure out how to supplement that. And the beginnings, much like my career, my failures were a really big blow to my self-esteem because it's all failures, right? It's like 99.9%, .9%, you know, to get to a point of where you have a 0 0.1 success and then you take that 0 0.1 success and then turn it into, into fertilizer and then you mm -hmm. grow more success, right? And so that resiliency was baked in just by repeat and failure and beating myself up till I created music that really connected beyond me to the world. Equally, thinking about how to supplement incomes for myself to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. So when I started, I was competing against, this is like 96, I'm having my first like big hits. I'm competing with the likes of like, you know, Max was already, Max Martin was pretty big, prolific already. Mm -hmm. He was having massive hits as well. And these guys were more, they're incredible. And I, I thought they were just like out of this mm -hmm. world, you know, prolific. And, but yet they also had, had built their own system, right? Had built their own studios, had, you know, incredible support and they've earned it. But I had to start from ground zero as well while I was looking up to these masters, including Giorgio Moroder, who, who I still consider one of the best of all time mm -hmm. and been a very kind friend to me and mentor. So that's what how it happened. That's how I've evolved to these what people consider these titles. Yeah, and I think it's interesting now because obviously the music landscape, business landscape is different, right? Technology, yeah. the amount of content out there, if that's what we'll call it, the amount of potential for creativity, monetizing, like all these words now that are pretty common and we use daily that, I mean, I didn't know them growing up. If they were around right. or if we were using them in common vernacular, I don't know, but I sure didn't know them. But now with maybe such a big market and so much opportunity, kind of sticking along the themes of your, you know, your early days, of if, what kind of things would you tell to maybe some of the creatives that are still in, kind of rising up in ranks in terms of how they should maybe view the business side, if, especially if they're not growing as quite organically as you did to where you, it sounds to me like you had a little bit of tandem growth in both things, the creative and business side, which obviously got you to where you're at. What kind of things would you tell to the, to the new crop? Yeah, this is a great question. And you also picked up on the, on the cues, the nuances of my answer. The difficult part was the narrative, right? What narrative was I forming throughout my growth, you know, as a teenager making pop records as a, you know, and, and it wasn't cool to make money off mm -hmm. your art. It wasn't cool to, to profit, but there were other cultures that made it cool. Like that's what's cool about like hip hop. Yeah. Like, so when I grew up with Dr. Dre and, and we ended up, you know, working in the same record label, right? So it was an honor and they had a strong identity as to showcasing, hey, we made it, you can make it mm. too. And that was the message I got from, from hip hop and, you know, EZE and NWA and all the music. So I grew up with these two dichotomies. It was, you know, gangster rap and the birth of gangster rap, right? And then West Coast <laughs> and Depeche Mode and Morrissey, right? And, and house music and techno. Wow. What influences? Right. This, I just had to pause for a yeah, moment. Yeah, this is like, the hood. What amazing time. What influences? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was like the, like the center of the universe for me when it came to music because I saw like gang banging and then I saw like these same gang bangers <laughs> listening to to Morrissey talking about his feelings and where he didn't belong right one week they're cruising to NWA and next week they're cruising to, <laughs> to suede head you know like going to drag and I'm like whoa what's going on here right the, what's going on here is that there's a universality to the art form of music right it's a language right so there's it's non-linguistic language right we have two mathematics and music and obviously ma music predating so to put a cue and a hold on that specific conversation, there is a, there was a dichotomy within me and I struggled with that. You know, there's this the idea of the sellout was like originally like just complete a misnomer and a, just a wrong, in my opinion, not a very toxic way of looking at output and distribution. Mm -hmm. And then there is this other idea of, gosh, if I don't do music full time, I'm, I'm a fraud, yeah. right? There's a sense that just because you know, this is me growing up. So this is my inner dialogue. I think that's also universal, isn't mm -hmm. it? You know, the artists, you know, stay true. They're like monks. They stay true to their art form in there. Therefore, that constitutes them as a real deal. This is not true. Mm. So that was how I evolved that mindset is, well, survival. I had no choice. Mm -hmm. You know, I had to 
pay my own way. I had to figure it out. So I had like eight multiple jobs, like as a teenager. And like, so picture this beginnings of like, I'm 13 years old on the USC campus and auditing everything I could because it was free for me. And I got into this program equally, you know, making tapes, copying, duping tapes, CDs, anything I can do to make side money. So I can just continue to take the bus to school or get whatever, you know, find some sort of way. And then, you know, if there was family support, it was, it's communal. My neighbor was my mentor. Like you find a way, but I saw this early on as I made peace with it. Like, look, I have to make peace within myself with this opinion of we must think of our future as portfolio before I had the financial mm. understanding of, you know, the true finance framework. Yeah. Right. And this is how I got into the VC world is how, because it made sense to me. And this is me as a teenager making sense of this. Well, I have to find at least eight other revenue lines, revenue streams to support my dream. And then I achieved my dream creating music alongside extraordinary artists that were in a sense distribution for me, but also very spiritually and deep self, giving me the tools to self author what it means to create art that can change the world to create art that can create a new language or identify with a community that might not be represented mm. or represented effectively. So marginalized as franchise communities. And that really resonated with me. So, so I was able to supplement originally the idea of from fraud. I'm a fake with, you know, having other ancillary income lines while I'm doing 20 hour days making music. Mm. So it wasn't fake it till you make it. It was more like I'm surviving. I have no time thinking of like, I love Amy Cuddy's work, but thinking of, you know, this idea of, and derivatives of fraudulent imposter syndrome, right? Like that doesn't even connect with me at all because the reality is my mindset is like, I had to do it. It's like breathing. I just have to do it. And in order to breathe, I need to eat in order to eat. You know, I need to be able to get from point A to point B. So it's this voracious appetite to fulfill my obligation to the world through the music I've created. So the externality from that mm. is a portfolio lifestyle. And so as they evolved and got older and started, you know, being introduced to different communities and leadership, including venture capital, including, you know, accelerators and, and all these things, these wonderful communities and leadership, I was started to acquire the frames and the vernacular to apply what I've been doing my whole life with a little bit more formidable growth. Mm. I want to jump around a bit here. One of the things that you mentioned is, you know, working with VCs and working with accelerators and just other platforms, we'll call it. I guess that's the word we use nowadays, right? Platforms. So I want to talk about collaboration and really just what that's meant in your career and like how you've managed to extend maybe further and collaborate outside of things, even in the music. Cause whether, I mean, I just, when I look at it, just, I see the diversity of the people you've worked with in music. And now it makes sense when I think about some of your earliest influences that you mentioned, like it's across the board, right? You're in a special place growing up in music, in my opinion, just geography wise and influence wise, but collaboration specifically, how have you managed to kind of like, like, how is that? That, that word or that theme kind of played a role in your life, whether it's through music and business and otherwise? It started when I was about nine, when I, this became an idea to me. I couldn't relate to the world I lived in. And so what I decided to do is, and I couldn't, you know, what I had a kind of a band, a techno band when I was a kid. Mm. And I didn't like that I couldn't rely on my friends to make music mm. with me. So I decided to learn everything. Myself. <laughs> That's one way to do it. <laughs> right. But what that did is it gave me the confidence to then, okay, now I'm an island. Right. right. And I realized it wasn't fun. Like it was, I mean, it's kind of like it was a rite of passage mm. for me where I'd sit and make music for just hours and hours and hours where, you know, if you've ever been isolated for a very long time, especially not speaking, that you tend to get awkward around other people. <laughs> and, so that's a litmus test as to the level of like intention and craft and work that I put into develop the skill of making music. But yeah, it became very lonely and self-fulfilling and became a feedback loop. So I wasn't growing mm. in the music I was making. And this is me as a teenager. Yeah. And then I realized that, well, you know, there are other people that can sing better than I can by like hands down, like who can do everything better than I can. So what makes me special right i kept asking myself these questions mm. 
And so coupled with, well, I can either keep doing this and be miserable or find people who were better at each of these aspects of making music, such guitars, bass, drums, every individual component to make a song, to write a song and then produce it. And that's what I did. And it coincided with people reaching out who heard there's this kid from like Southeast LA making techno music and house music. Right? And that sent me to doorsteps of people like Giorgio Moroder and Enrique Iglesias and other artists who gave me a shot and and I just didn't take that for granted. And that's that's how that's what gave me the opportunity mm. to collaborate. Right. And then I've had more fun doing yeah. this. And it was safer too for a very long time. It was safer because I didn't have to risk so much anymore. Right. The failure was no longer upon only my shoulders. Yeah. <laughs> so it was it, it, it was freeing to a certain extent. And then I ended up at Interscope and Realized the stakes were way higher because this time I was creating content not just for the world and everyone would hear it and the failure would be on the major platform, Mm. but equally the responsibility to shareholders essentially was really high and that was upon the shoulders of the producer because the way Universal Music and these major labels operates, the content and thereby the artist that will define the value of the share of the valuation of the company at the given its market standing. Mm. And, and so that's, that's how I understood understanding the financial world because I was there during those conversations and was privy to, to very, very colorful conversations on this very matter. Oh man. As I hear you, hear you talk about this, Fernando, and the idea of, of, you know, being alone or being an island on yourself for, for all the entrepreneurs that are listening to this and otherwise like those solopreneurs or those people that go at it by themselves, <laughs> My heart goes out to them, man, because I couldn't do it. If I didn't have Shirag and the other co-founder of Mission Matters here, no way that's happening. Like, that's hard. Like, that's hard. And I find that the idea of collaborating and getting new ideas and bringing, involving other people, like you said, I mean, it's just more fun. I feel like it's more enjoyable if you, if you can do it. So let's look at one point to that. And this is kind of what I do mm-hmm. these days. A lot of what I do is just look at ego. Ego is very effective. Ego as a construct, right? The cognitive output. It's very, very helpful as a tool for resilience, for strength, right? But it can be, it could work for you and against mm. you, right? Egos will give you the confidence to perform. That's what we use ego for. And there's ego, which is not constructive, which is the insecurities of competition, right? It's the insecurities of measuring yourself against the other person in the room. That's useless. Mm. So we teach ego as, a, as an instrument of growth. We teach ego as an instrument of you're only in competition with yourself to be better than the last hour you were here. Mm. Right? You're only in competition with the person that entered that door, right? Yourself. And how will you exit? Mm-hmm. So in my opinion, what humbled me as to not as to have an ego, because I started as a teenager with an ego. I mean, it's very important to have. You should have an ego, but 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 it was mitigated because how humbled I was by doing it by myself, right? Why it's not so hard when you get to that point. I'm ready to collaborate because you get theoretically you should get to a point where you realize it's way more fun to do it with someone mm-hmm. else. It's way more fun to share the successes and the failures yeah. equally. Right. And it's way more fun on a, I mean, just on every single level you can count on, mm-hmm. right? even on the equity side. I mean, it's, you get to a point, you know, after what is 10 million, you just don't feel a difference as far as the endorphin and the, the hedonic exchange that you have with making more money than that, right? What's that power law you get? But yeah, mm-hmm. so it's over and over. You can prove this out. Yeah. So considering, you know, whether it's in music or on the VC side and otherwise, I mean, or working in records, you've worked on with and for and on some really big platforms. And, you know, one thing I feel is at the core and the way that I view the world, so not putting this on you, but the way I view the world is that, you know, it's through sales. Like I I want to, I either have something of value that I want to exchange, whether it be for, you know, attention, could be monetary, could be a lot of different things, but there's something that an idea or otherwise that I want to sell in one way, shape or form or to, to give to somebody else. Like what, what have you found or what are some things that you think about when it goes, comes into a value? 
evaluating how to get others interested in something you're doing. And again, that could be music, that could be business or, or otherwise, but to get somebody else to get their attention and to get them interested in something that you're interested in. Well, I have to step a few steps back to articulate this more effectively, in my opinion, as far as what I do. What I think of the world and your ultimate output, let me just quickly define a couple of things, and this will help the conversation. How I define creativity is the ultimate skill for creation. How I define the difference between skill and talent, well, skill is a repetitive action that's mastered, and talent is the ability to move the limbic system, the ability for emotional transference, emotion transference, right? And so if we look at the big picture on how I understand the world, if you just focus on these couple points that if a creative entity is a creative individual, someone that creates in general, just in creates, creates a new path, way to work, creates a new model, new financial model, anything, that's all creative. The ultimate form of creativity, I argue, the ultimate is creating reality itself. That should be a mic drop moment because what that means essentially is if you can dream it, think it, then ask yourself if what you're trying to solve is a complex problem, a complicated problem, or a complexity problem, right? So these two dichotomies. Mm-hmm. A complicated problem or a complexity problem. A complicated problem is pieces that have solvable, you know the problems, it's solvable pieces. Right? Mm-hmm. So you just look at the solvable pieces to solve a complicated problem. Right? And therefore, you combine these pieces and theoretically have an answer or solution to get you to the next evolution of your problem. A complexity problem is a problem which you don't fully or understand what questions to even ask, right? There's too many unknown variables, mm-hmm. right? So most of our problems are actually complicated problems, especially in business, because the models exist. And this is how I go about, how I go about every venture that I take on or challenge. As I look at it with these lenses, you know, how am I creative? How am I creating something that doesn't exist yet? And then I look at, is there equally, that's the complexity question. And then what is the complicated question here? Well, what pieces are solved and have been solved? Mm-hmm. Then how do I make the leap between complicated and complexity? That's where originality lays. And these are more esoteric and abstract, I think, answers to what you asked, but I hope that helps a little bit. No, I, I think you're very clear. And you're very clear in the way that you look at it and the way that you frame it. And I, I had a feeling that our the lenses that we see certain things would be slightly different. So I'm glad that you gave me and the audience a insight into your lenses and how you view things. So to take it maybe one step as you've broken down these, you know, what problems have been solved or not solved. And you get, is there a point when you feel like, or, or when there is a point, I should say, that you feel like, okay, what I'm solving or what what value I'm adding is worth more time and effort that you're like, okay, this is a scalable idea. This is something that I want to spend more time on. Like, how does that part of the process look like the next stage of where you were at, I should say? You know, that's where behavioral and neuroeconomics really come in handy. People say I'm a polymath. I think it comes from the fact that I'm obsessive about research, like over the top, mm. like it's you know, it's baked into the way my brain yeah. works. I find my peace in like learning. That's where I find my, it's like the more, so I'm a multiple input type of individual. My brain works faster the more inputs it has. It's very common in autistic and, you know, children that have, or, or individuals that have autism. I don't have autism, but just, I find that parallel mm-hmm. that my brain works this way. And so back to neuroeconomics and let's say Kahneman and Amos Tversky, right? They say they have this idea called the sunk cost fallacy, right? It's when, the return on investment is no longer feasible, right? So basically a short version of this is you buy this classic car and this classic car is really sexy and it's amazing, but it's costing you more money than you get from the hedonic aspect of of driving it, right? From the joy you get from driving it. The utility has gone down. You can actually measure it, how many minutes and hours you enjoy driving it versus how many minutes and hours you spend. It spends at a mechanic shop where you're working on it to make it better, make it run, right? That's a sunk cost fallacy. You reach a threshold. Much like a thermostat works, it's a threshold of one or two degrees. That's what tells your thermostat to turn on or off. So this is what I use. I think that the idea, the term I would use to solve this problem, in other words, when do you stop investing in something that's not working? Well, it's impossible for you to predict 
when you should stop, but safely, because, you know, what if you kept going, right? But it's, it's the safer bet I would use is to put a backstop, just like the military uses, to when to pull out of a situation that can be deadly or dangerous. What I call my backstop is a threshold. I write down a certain window of parameters that I'm willing to risk, right? Okay, I'm willing to get this cold. I'm willing to stay in 32 degrees, but that's my stop. That's my backstop. I'm willing to get to this heat. I'm willing to spend 100, you know, DJ at 116, 118 degree weather, because after that, my laptop will not yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My DJs yeah. won't work, right? So that's what I mean by thresholds. I think that is, for me, more effective way of looking at, you know, as a founder or how I would look at my business. That is already assuming you've done the research. Mm-hmm. In other words, it's a product market fit, maybe not two years, but by the time you launch. Mm-hmm. Yep. Right? Like your MVP is at the early stages of where like, it's like a temperature gauging, right? Like that's what pop music it does really well. Like great producers are able to predict the market you know, and align it with when the single comes out or when the album comes out, right? Mm-hmm. It's all fashion-based and genre-based. So I think to answer your question is threshold, defining those thresholds. What are your backstops? Yeah, yeah, that's great. Well, I want to take a moment here and I won't hog the whole hour. We normally keep these to about an hour or so. And I want to get some of those in the audience involved. So does anybody, would anybody like to ask an end or question? And if not, I can keep going. Everybody here knows that, but I want to make sure to get those involved. <laughs> Adam, I would love to ask the question. Welcome, Victor. Yes. This is Victor Kostrup. I am the CEO of the company Fine Designs. First of all, I want to just say I really, really enjoy this question and answer. I mean, you're just like one of the best guests we ever had. So thank you for such a deep conversation and the best answers I heard on the many, many topics. Thank you. And I really like how you emphasize about the ego. I remember some time ago, I worked with another teacher and she pointed out to me the same thing similar about the pride. She said, society looks as a pride as something negative, but pride is that's what inspires us to build a legacy. Pride is lead us to be successful in just like you explained there is a negative and there is a positive side to that. So it just up to you as a person, how you're going to direct your life for your use for benefit or not. So, but what I want to ask you is this, I pay a lot of attention to your biography and I work with many, besides my business, I work with many young people, help them to unleash their potential and everybody's afraid where they are of unknown, of uncertainty. And, and, you know, like we, as a certain age, we think, well, if I only had this, if I only had that, if I had the rich parents, if I had the support like John had and that person, that neighbor, but I didn't have that. Hearing your story, you didn't have that anything. And you said the biggest motivation for you was, is actually to survive. And because you were looking to survive and you need to provide for getting from A to Z, you had to make that step, that step. So my question is, do you think if you had the rich parents, if you had unbelievable support that you didn't have to worry about to survive, to provide for yourself, do you think you would be as successful as you are today? That's a great question. Really great question. Actually, it's one of those questions, philosophical questions I ask myself. To add a bit of color to it, my parents were rich. They were rich in trauma. I see. And so that level of resilience of trauma, I inherited. So we now know this as a bit of the epigenetic longevity, you know, a legacy trauma studies at Harvard, which are prolific. This is inherent. So no matter if you come from a wealthy family or financially, it says specifically, Right. Let's just reframe this, right? Let's say my parents came, let's just say if they came from like high wealth, right? Right. But the realities are the same, right? In this case, the product would still be the same. My output would still be the same. I don't believe that would change anything. Now, this is more a philosophical question. Like, did this come out of the need to survive or did this come out of the need of an inherent understanding of my connection to the world. And so as much as intrinsic work 
that I've done to understand this question, I can safely answer that I now know the answer. My output would have been the same because it wasn't them who chose my path. It was I. I see. Thank you. All right. Ken, you want to go next? Sure. Happy to. Hey, Fernando, so great to have you here. And my name is Ken Eslick. I'm host of the Leaders Lab podcast and CEO of the Leaders Lab. And it's awesome to be here. Your background's incredible. And my question for you is, you know, you seem to have been playing at a high level in creativity on both the artistic side and the business side for, I guess it plays off the last question, right? That you had to get out there and hustle. You had to make money. So you had to sort of have this head around business. But I find that that's very unique. And certainly in my own experience, I feel like I'm very creative when it comes to business and completely frozen in a way when it comes to what I would consider the arts, right? Which luckily my kids have that in them. And I probably have it somewhere in me. Because you play so well on both sides of this, to you, is that normally a mental block that people have? Or is it a familiarity? Or is it just getting over old belief systems or what? Because if someone asked me if I was creative, I'd say in what avenue, right? And if you said in business, I'd be like, yeah, I can play with the best of them. If you said in music, I'd be like, I love music, but no, you probably don't want me writing and you certainly don't want me singing a song, right? Like, does that question make sense? Yeah, I actually, it makes perfect sense. It's actually a great question. I'm going to just continue where I left off with the answer, the previous answer to get to this point. The idea that where you come from defines, gives you a leg up, or gives you any sort of advantage, cognitive environment. You know, we understand behavior determinism and that your environment determines a certain amount of your output and your how your genes are expressed, et cetera, right? But there's, within every reality, there's this moment or moments of inflection and enlightenment. And if we're able to create those moments of enlightenment for it within ourselves, we can then author how we see ourselves in that given moment. In psychology, it's called something of sort of a wise psychological intervention, which you intervene and you can in interrupt the autonomic dialogue you have in your head, right? There's 5% of access of the words you hear, the inner broken center language of your brain, right? And the rest is subconscious. So I think in reality, one, the key here is to master this as a skill. And yeah, it has been misconstrued. The idea of creativity has been misconstrued. Right? This is why I go out and postulate this. I show this, I make my argument, creativity is the ability to create. Everyone creates, therefore everyone's creative, right? That's my postulate. And I go out and prove it and I show people how in real time, you know, I go on stages and the audience, you know, co-writes a song with us, with myself. And this is my anatomy of a hit module and anatomy of creativity modules that I do around the world. And thereby kind of just debunk in real time because I show you that you are co-creating a song with me. I turn your stories into song with my team, right? So to answer your question, I think it's the lenses in which you choose to adopt. If you choose to adopt that you're a creative because you've, you've created a new financial model, then you're correct. If you choose to adopt a mindset and narrative that you're not creative because you could only create financial models, then you're also correct. But the most accurate assessment that I've made across, you know, multidisciplinary orthogonal is the key word research is that at the end of the day true enlightenment is the ability to self-author to define your own narrative as consistently as possible and equally follow through with action to support that narrative that's how you create new neural networks that's how you create change so if you'd like to take this as a tool and then think about your experiences and then challenge yourself, what is the best narrative I can create at this very moment to rethink my existence and my output and my meaning? And I guarantee you, you will have a different perception of how you see yourself. I love that. Thank you. And I have been leaning that way. Like it feels better to lean into my creativity, if that makes sense, and to take yeah. credit for it. Yeah, that's um, right. Yeah. So thank you so much. Equally, can I give you one more tip? Yes, sir. When you do this to become a better narrator, to become a better writer, to become a better author, right? So, mm -hmm. so when you do self-authoring and, and intervene with your autonomic narrative, right, the inner voice dialogue, oh, you're not good enough, and that type of dialogue is to become very creative at rethinking that narrative. How could you use this and be more prolific 
at this, right? So it's also a skill. One way is to do it, like writing your version is in journal, et cetera. The other way is just to, as much as you can intervene when you have a thought you don't necessarily agree with, or it's not how you speak to your your family, it's not how you speak to your best friend. Like that's how you should be treating your your this dialogue to begin with. You know, you develop a skill where you become more prolific at this, and now you're you know you're lecturing and you're you're making hit records and doing all sorts of weird stuff that don't make sense, but makes perfect sense to me. Awesome, thank you. <laughs> that's awesome, Denley. I think you were next. Yeah, thanks for the gems that you've been dropping, producing some of these hot cognitive outputs for us to ruminate. <laughs> so so I, my question is, is twofold. One's probably more historical in terms of your own autobiography. So the first question is really to how has your lived experience growing up, assuming around like African-American culture, that hip hop culture helped form some of your own thinking? That's kind of looking back. And the second question is, and this goes to some of your philosophical, when did you become aware of your own hermeneutic? And what I mean by hermeneutic for others, your own way of interpreting the reality around you. What is that philosophical crucible, so to speak, where it's like, hey, this is the sort of the lens, the gestalt I'm going to be looking at this sort of world, right? You know, for me, it was a level of Einsteinian thinking, right? Einstein comes up with this sort of holistic way of looking at reality instead of a Newtonian way of looking at reality where it was more parts and pieces. Einstein kind of says the world is a little more integrated. Space and time is not a dualism as such, but it is an integrated whole. So when did you become more aware of your particular philosophical bent that helped you within the work you do? So the first one, in terms of your formative years, in terms of your autobiography, how did your upbringing around that sort of hip-hop community help form you? And then in terms of when did you become self-aware of those sort of hermeneutic, those philosophical cognitive tools that you've used to be where you are today? It's quite a bit of academic name dropping, which I do appreciate. As a fellow ontologist, <laughs> I, I, love, I, I, love, I love this stuff. But the, the reality is I did have some help, right? Like, so how I, I discovered, so I learned English arguably through, I say arguably because, you know, my family is speaking Spanish at home, you know, it's the first language, but, but I didn't connect to Spanish originally. I heard my inner voice in, in English. And so, so I had a broken radio that just played, you know, the FM stations at the end. And I always shared a story because I, it's one of my favorites. This broken radio had an FM. They only could have access to the to the last stations in the the college radio era, like like space, like the eighty nine point nines, like space of the FM. And you know, I had massive insomnia. And so when I was very young, from the age of like since I can remember, I think it was three. Some of the first lectures that I heard on these stations, NPR and and college radio stations, were Alan Watts, Noam Chomsky, Hume, you know, Kissinger, like just the master orators of like arguably the past 300 years and that gave me a subconscious understanding that the world is bigger than what i'm seeing on the streets or you know the not having and this western perception of like we have a bad because we're from the hood or first generation you know into a country i think that that was baked in really early so i think that was a bit of a hidden advantage but and then learning more about how much an environment can influence your existence and how it shapes your reality. And then at the same time, learning what really reality is according to how your brain forms its own version interpretation, right? So I adopted very early on that my brain's a filter. And that was my philosophy. And I couldn't see beyond, you know, certain color spectrums. I couldn't see beyond what I mean by that. Like, you know, if you look at white it contains every color arguably right but you, you don't see that so i couldn't see that but i knew it existed i knew that frequencies existed beyond 20 hertz and 20 kilohertz right i knew it existed but i couldn't i i felt it right i sensed it everything i did required sense extra sensory right like perception of reality because that, that's where i lived in you know I, I couldn't tell you you know what drove me to create you know play this chord but this chord led to the song so my reality was, was shaped in those two folds. It was inspired by incredible thinkers that, I mean, I heard Alan Watts at the three or four years old. I couldn't understand what he meant by everything he was saying, but it just sounded amazing because I sensed what he was saying. Right? So I think in that way, that inspired this trajectory mm-hmm. that the, the limitations are only limitations of the mind. And then you can accelerate this disbandment of the removal of those limitations by collaboration. 
Well, thanks for that perspective. Yes, fellow ontologist and on my podcast at the Coach's Corner, I kind of move in, bring some philosophy, psychology, anthropology, sociology, all into related to business and how life and work are integrated. And so I, I appreciate your thing when you were dropping some of those philosophical gems and said, hmm, that's a man that's really self-conscious and self-aware and how he's using that in terms of in the economic sense of producing something colorful for the world. So I appreciate what you've shared. And again, Denley McIntosh, and thanks, Bernardo, for responding. I'll add one more tidbit to that. Thank you so much. It's a great question. So so when I was on tour with some of these artists, and I remember Lady Gaga being on tour and, and I was working with her and just the whole team was great. And and I would sit out there in the audience and be 300 stadiums of 300 people and extraordinary, right? So I'm sitting here and I'm feeling like Gustav Le Bon, right? Who's witnessing, this is the father of sociology, psychology, like just prolific. And I'm sitting there and assessing like what drives this? What you see this and, and I've witnessed this phenomenon in my whole career, like what drives people to connect and find their true selves in others, right? And how I've navigated this world, including this ability to self-author is an ability to become a true mirror. How I was able to have a consistency in the level of artists, best in class performers to work with is I just became a really good mirror. I show them a version of themselves they've never seen before, right? And that's how I did it. Awesome. Nice. So we try to normally keep these to about an hour. So I want to first qualify your time, Fernando. Do you have, do you have a couple minutes longer or I just want to make sure? Yeah, okay. yeah, I'll go for it. Yeah. I want to, so Shirag had a little bit of a, a little bit of an audio difficulty. So I, I need to get his question in there because he told me about this earlier too. And he told me he wouldn't tell me the story. He said that he heard part of it from you. He said, tell Fernando to tell you the story about Bruno Mars. And maybe when you first got going with him, he said, you told him the story at the World Economic Forum. <laughs> Oh my God. Yeah, that was purely for the World Economic Forum. But, but Bruno is, is it's just an extraordinary individual. When I started around Interscope around, this is I think around 2000, it started earlier, but when I started in as a like full-time producer, I had a studio in Hollywood and it was kind of like the birth ground, like ground zero for Bruno Mars. It, it was, I mean, Sia, like Pussycat Dolls and that era of, like megastars just starting to, to blossom. And one of these artists that we shared, you know, shared studios with, I shared, I had the studio in the back and Bruno and, and I think it was the Smithington's production team shared the studio in the front. I remember a couple of conversations that, that still stay with me that were pretty special. And, you know, we, we recorded a lot of music and I don't think any of it, or maybe some of it got released. I don't know. Like there's just a lot of people in my, in my that I don't even mention really that much that we've created a lot of music together. But Bruno's one of them. And and he would he would see, my, I'd work with so many beautiful women, artists, right? He didn't know who they were because they weren't as big as they are now. And he'd be like, how? Like, how on earth? Like, he sings for everybody. And he's like, like, I knew who he was and what he was. Like, I knew he was special. Mm. Like, I just knew it without a doubt. But the rest of the music industry didn't, mm. right? He was a songwriter who was, like also an artist, but the industry saw him as a songwriter. I'm like, this guy's an artist, mm. like, and he's trying to do the artist thing. He's performing around town, and he kept coming to my studio, and, and as we songwrite, and then he'd come back. You know, Pussycat Dolls are showing up, and they're like, you know, a full get up, full gear. Paris Hilton's coming <laughs> through, like, so I have all these people coming, just like a, a, a parade, a circus of, you know, up and coming next gen icons. And he's like, how are you doing this? Right. They'd come to, to my back door and say, like, dude, like, what are you doing? Like, how is this happening to you? And I said, well, I just make music with them and the rest just happens. Right? And, and he's he's like, he comes back another another week. I remember this. And he goes, I don't think I connect with, you know, why am I not? Why don't I have a single yet? Why don't I have, well, you know, an opportunity to really show the world what I can do? And I'm being careful about the words I, I choose out of respect because I love and respect the artists I work with. And I said, well, I imagine and I picture a year from now, everyone is going to know your name. And it's before he got signed. It's wow. right before he got signed. And sure, sure enough, you know, he is featured six months after that. He's 
featured on a I forget the artist, but he was massive record. He was featured mm. on. Does anybody know that that song that his first Bruno Mars feature? Was it Beautiful Girls? Yeah, yeah. No, it was, it was the one after that first feature. It was like a rap song. Oh yeah, Nothing on You. Mm. Right, and then it just like blew up, and his name was Household. And of course, they gave him a deal. I think it was, it was started with with the other one you mentioned, but but nothing you was the one that was like, oh my god, like everybody knew his name. Wow. And that's the last time I spoke to him. <laughs> and the only other times I would see him was like crossing paths on at the Grammys. But still to this day, I remember like here's a kid who had every skill mm. and ability to change the world, but all it takes sometimes is just someone to say, hey, I see it, keep going. You're almost there. <laughs> and though I can't take credit for that, I I saw it in his eyes that it, it meant something to him. That's a, it's a great story. All right, so let's say these will be the last two questions. want to be respectful of the time on this one. All right, so let's see. Veterans Memorial News, if you want to go next. I think you were next. Hi. Wow. You emit the best energy, and you're just a true leader. My name is Shonda Thomas. Hello, Fernando. Hello, Vin. Hi, Shonda. You assist artists in finding their magic. Thank you for touching so many souls. I believe finding one's passion is contagious and you bring that out in people. And I like to say, dissolve your ego and start over, build a better version. I love that, I, thank I, you. I built Veterans Memorial News because I'm an artist and I wanted to find a creative way to pass on what I believe is remembering where we came from, you know, peace and freedom. And I believe you dissected your happiness in your youth and found a solution that created happiness for so many around the world. How talent, I mean, genius. No risk, no reward as, as an artist. We have to be, I believe. And I believe you should love what you do. My question to you, sir, you. would be, thank you for speaking and thank you for letting me speak and, and taking the time to to listen to me. My question to you is, do you believe that we are magnetic? We're magnetically, magnetically driven to one another. And as creators, we identify uniquely with certain astrological versions of ourselves. This is it's great. Thank you. You know, this is more, I think for me, a semantic and linguistic problem to identify what exactly it is that we're doing, right? There's many schools of thought on this, materialist, non-materialist, determinist, non-determinist. What I think is, at, and I, I'm going to try to avoid saying this without using the words energy or frequency, that's baked into everything we do. I believe that we do have a kinetic momentum that we can capture and exchange. I believe there are universal power laws in nature that just cross everything, right? And, and, and that power law of nature is called a dichotomy, right? Yin and yang, positive, negative, like everything is essentially a dichotomy. They, they coexist, they're one. So my philosophy is once you can can understand how to at least recognize this way of being, that you can truly sense what the world's asking from you. And that's how what I just sit through and sit in and every day. And specific to, to again to what led this to me to this insight. Well, I think Ultimately, I like to light myself on fire and hopefully the world will watch me burn. And I do that through my music. I do that through whatever business I can help, whatever narrative I can add to, to a movement, whatever contribution I can make as a, as a creative entity. That's how I do it. You're a diamond in the rough. There are so many people that should look to you for encouragement on how to survive, first of all, from you know building a bad environment in a situation and changing it into something that evolved into musical identity, which evolved into wanting to share that with others around you. And, you know, just no risk, no reward. I'm going to say that. Stay humble. I agree. And I learned a lot from my father. He sells time through process improvements with tool making. And we can all do the best that we can do to our ability. It's hard to train your brain and learn something new. And I learned that from your podcast, Adam and Chirag. Thank you for hosting and for letting me speak again. God bless you all. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. I felt that for sure. If you thought what I've done previously was was impressive, wait till you see what I'm doing next. Oh, I'd like to hear that. All right. So last question here. Set, if you want to go. 
Yes. Hi, Fernando. This is Seth from Guadalajara, Mexico. All right. Hola. <laughs> um, first of all, I'm, a, I'm such a fan because of what you did with Lady Gaga. I believe Dance in the Dark is one of the biggest and greatest pop songs of all the time. No question. Wow, thank you. <laughs> So my question for you is, how did you find the courage to present your creative ideas or to take creative decisions in a room full of people who has probably more experience than you when you were the like, when you were like the new kid in the music industry? How did you find that courage to to present those those creative ideas? Well, that's a great question. So I answered this with, you know, the best piece of advice I can give to children, including my own. I say. The person next to you is more afraid than you are. So what that means is pretty self-explanatory, but what that meant in those situations is that nobody knew how broke I was. <laughs> no one knew how much I thought I suffered. No one knew who I was, right? So at that point, my Sun Tzu Art of War raft has been burned very early on. So right. I went off at that moment. I am <laughs> I'm swimming in ice water. <laughs> so... Working with these artists was a life raft, right? It was the other way around, right? It was more like, it was like a deep sense of gratitude where I'm like, wow, like they see, they see something. So I'm going to prove them they weren't wrong. I don't want to let them down. I don't, you know, and, and equally, you know, there's a, there's a metaphoric gun to my head, right? That, you know, you can't fail for these artists. They're extraordinary. You, you have to give them everything that you have. That's, yeah. that's, that's what it is. It's just a paradigm shift that I, a narrative that I, that was formed in my head that I, that I had control of, and my narrative was like, you know, they're probably more afraid to hear my ideas than I am to show them. Yeah, that's great. That's an amazing point of view, and well, thank you so much. Thank you. Awesome. Well, Fernando, just want to say thank you for coming on today. This was awesome. I know I, know I thoroughly enjoyed it. And based off the questions, the, the interaction from the others on here and just the quality, and I think I speak for them as well as saying that everybody else enjoyed it as well. Excited to get this put out on the podcast and all the platforms so that others can benefit also from your knowledge. So that being said, how, I, how we normally end these are we will be meeting again, everybody tuning in every Thursday. We host a Twitter space space at 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And normally we're going to have topics ranging from everything like what we talked about today to finance, tech, you name it, business, entertainment. We do quite a few topics and have amazing speakers like Fernando on the line. So come tune in next week. And again, this will be posted on missionmatters.com. And Fernando, again, thanks for coming on. Really appreciate it. Adam, can I leave with, can I leave with a shout out? Absolutely. Yeah, what I say is you're only as good as your collaborators. You're only as good as the people around you. And I was only as good as the talent I surrounded myself with. And that includes Lady Gaga, Sia, Kylie Minogue, Britney Spears, Paris Hilton, and all the extraordinary artists I've worked with. That's what led to this. So thank you. Fantastic. Thanks, everyone.